you know, whether it's through food or customs or language, you know, we have tried not not perfectly by any means, but we've tried to do as much as we can to connect them to that side uh, of their heritage. And I think in connecting with my birth family now, that's then obviously uh, in a helpful way accelerated that to some degree for my kids. So I'm Rush Witt, and you're listening to Straight to the Heart, a podcast from New Growth Press. Each episode includes interesting talks with Christian writers, theologians, and friends. We hear who they are, what they think, how they approach their important work in ministry, and the moments and influences that changed their lives. Today, I talked with author, counselor, poet, husband, dad, and all-around great friend, Jonathan Holmes. I really mean it. He's the author of The Company We Keep, Counsel for Couples, Rescue Skills, Rescue Plan, and his newest book on identity issues. Today, I asked Jonathan about his newest book, his important work through leading Fieldstone Counseling Center, and what really makes him happy in life and ministry. We talked about his challenging childhood years as a pastor's kid, as well as his adoption, his Korean heritage, and growing up in the Deep South. Jonathan is a joyful and interesting guy, and I can't wait for you to listen in on our conversation. This is Straight to the Heart. And I'm really excited about the book you're writing on identity issues. Yeah. Yeah. How how is it going now, the process? It's it's good, man. Like I did a little bit of work. I've got I'm at twenty thousand words right now. So yeah. So I'm like at five thousand. Like I have content for every chapter like written, like at least three or four thousand words. So it just seemed to come out. I mean, obviously it needs a lot of cleaning up. That's why I sent some of those samples to you and Ruth and Barb to kind of take a look at. But um yeah, I mean, I hope that I hope that it's helpful, and you know what you guys would potentially be looking for. Um, I yeah, so I'm you know eager to hear back from Ruth and Barb in terms of you know we hate it, we love it, change this or fix this or whatever. But um, yeah, so I'm sure, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. It's chug, it's chugging, it's chugging along. So at this point, what do you think is the most meaningful part of it to you as you're, have you, as you've been writing through it and thinking about the topic, what really gets, <clears throat> gets you going and, uh, what are you really interested in? I think I, I'd probably say just like the identity formation process of how do, like, how do we help kids and teens who are being shaped and formed by our culture in terms of how they, they how they think about themselves how do we kind of come in with this third way of navigating essentially a gospel identity of helping kids understand uh, who they are before the Lord. They're created by God. They're loved by God. They're known by God. Um, and, you know, really trying to have God's voice, parental voice being kind of the loudest voice in their head rather than culture or even their own voice. So trying to kind of carry that theme throughout all the different chapters on gender, sex, athletics, academics. I thought about adding another chapter on like kids who find their um, identity, like in their appearance. But for right now, I just have those, like those five big, kind of like those five major topics. But um, yeah, I did, I did a little bit of survey work too, and like reached out to some different people. So I've got some different stories and quotes that I've been able to pull from like real life you know, parents and human beings, which I think always adds like a nice touch in the book. Like, so you're not only just hearing my voice. So yeah, but it's been all that being said, I think my fear at the front end of like the word count and the timeline, um, I just think this new system my mind just seems to be working for me. So I've been able to kind of get it out there on paper. So yeah, you were saying the other day that you had settled into a nice routine of uh, maybe 500 words a day, and that works for you. Yes. And, yeah, every and, day. Like, I'm not, I haven't stayed, like, I've kind of fallen off the bandwagon here and there, I think, the past few weeks, but pretty consistently every day, I've been trying to read 500 words. I've been, you know, trying to read, like, I've got a stack of books next to me that I've been utilizing. So it just, it, it's broken it up into much doable chunks, much more doable chunks, which, you know, again, I don't know why I've never done this before, but it just, I'm like, yeah, like, okay, I think I can do this. So 
Do you do you enjoy the process of writing? You've obviously written uh, a handful of books so far. Uh, so, uh, what's your what has your bit process been like on the previous books? And do you enjoy the process? Is it kind of a grind to you, or it's a grind? It well, I'd say the lot like rescue skills and rescue plan was a grind. It was. I think I came into it. I mean, first it was only going to be one book, and Deepak had told me, "Hey, I'm going to do the the main write on it." You just kind of come back over and do a heavy rewrite because that's what him and Pierre had done for pastor and counseling. That's the only reason I signed on because I'm like, great, like you're going to do all the heavy lifting. I'll kind of come in and add, you know, a couple of quotes here, a Bible verse here. And then he got tied up with that 31 day devotional series with PNR and he was like incapacitated. He's like, hey, dude, can you, how about you do the first write on it? And then I'll come in and do a heavy rewrite. And I'm like, hey. And then I mean, the book just kept getting bigger and bigger because he'd be like, oh, that's great. Why don't we add a chapter on this? And let's add a chapter on that. And like, hey, what if we... <laughs> so the project just kept on growing. So that one was tough. That one was tough. I mean, not in a bad... Like a, it was just hard in the sense of like, there was a lot of work. Um, the friendship book wasn't hard. Just It was my first book. And I made the mistake of thinking like, oh, I did six talks, like six talks at a retreat like i'll just turn those into chapters and uh kevin meath who was the editor at cruciform he was like yeah this isn't gonna work like they, they need a lot of work like you can't just take a sermon as it were and turn it into a chapter so that was a good learning experience for me yeah so what other what other kinds of writing have you done obviously those are trade books those are counseling mm-hmm. oriented books but you're also you've been into poetry writing. And yes, that's really yes, interesting to yes. me because I have yes. a really struggle. I struggle with poetry appreciation, I guess maybe you would call it yeah. if you're in college, take take a <laughs> class. I I never had poetry appreciation. Um, but you you really appreciate poetry. Help me appreciate poetry. Yeah. Why why do you like it? <laughs> you know, I think it's been something that in high school I remember her name was Mrs. Sharinga. She was my English teacher my senior year. She was passionate about poetry and we would read these poems. They'd be like two or three lines. And she could wax eloquently for like 45 to 50 minutes about the meaning behind it. And, you know, being the dumb senior in high school, I'm like, how how are you getting that, you know, from, you know, two, two or three lines of poetry? So I don't, I think it's been a later appreciation, I would say. And here's what I normally tell people and what I tell myself. For me, poetry helps me communicate a feeling or an experience. Um, so in a way for me, we're prose or to just talk it out loud conversationally or dialogically. There's something about poetry that captures a feeling, a memory, an experience, um, something that just lies below the surface in just a really beautiful way. So poetry for me, at least, I, I think people write and read poetry for a variety of reasons. But for me, at least, uh, that's been that's been a huge part of it, huge part of the motivation for me to both read it and write it. Well, that makes, that makes a lot of sense because the way that you just described poetry is a very similar description for counseling as someone who loves and values counseling. And how do you see the connection between poetry and counseling, whether it would be utilizing poetry and counseling or just the dynamic of what writing poetry does and what counseling is really about what spiritual growth is about right uh i mean you and i both yeah we're both counselors and you know the irony is probably that so much of our counseling we we push people to poetry and scripture i mean psalms you know pretty much the predominance of wisdom literature you know is written in poetry not prose form and I think sometimes we forget that. We just think of the psalm. We just think of like the Bible as the Bible. You know, it's just this propositional truth material, but I means a lot of scripture that we encourage our counselees to read and to engage with is poetry. Um, and, and I think it's, I think that's helpful. I think a lot of Old Testament commentators like Derek Kidner and Trumper Longman and Robert Alter have been helpful for me in that of just understanding you know, just because it's poetry doesn't mean that there's not really rich theological truth and depth uh, in there. You know, it's not just, oh, people are talking about their feelings. 
uh, there's there's beauty, there's symmetry, there's parallelism, there's a, a lot I think that can be drawn. And so I think there I think the reason why we tend to assign some of those passages or utilize a lot of those passages in our counseling is because we realize it captures something of the human experience that prose just is a little bit flatter in describing. There's something about you know how David describes you know when people are against him uh, that in poetry form just feels much more alive and active. So you know again I think the irony is we probably don't talk a lot about poetry in counseling or the use of it, but we use it a lot I think in counseling probably unbeknownst to ourselves. I don't think I've ever heard how you came to biblical counseling, what your introduction to biblical yeah. counseling was like, and maybe even the role that counseling has played in your life. Ironically, Rush, I, when I came to, came, you know, the school that I came to at that time, uh, they had just transitioned from more of like a integrative psychology type department into a biblical counseling department. Uh, when I had come into the school, like my major was in history and in education. I really wanted to be like a history teacher uh, but there was something about biblical counseling, which was at least that school's closest analog to like psychology, that that's always been an interest of mine. So I just enrolled in that as a major as well. So kind of major doubled in counseling and in history, but then just really fell in love with the content and the material, the students, the professors. Um, it was It was, I would say, fundamentally reorienting for me to think about psychology and human motivation and functioning from a biblical counseling perspective. Again, that would not even, that would not have even been language, you know, that I would have even had, would have even been able to articulate. I don't think uh, I just thought like, yeah, this is counseling. This is psychology as it were. So my, my time in undergrad at the institution I attended was, was really formative for me. My freshman year uh, in chapel, David Pallison came and talked. And I remember we would have different chapel speakers come through. And I remember like one of the faculty members saying something about a guy named Dave Pallison coming in and talking. And I'm like, I didn't like, who's like, who's David Pallison? I never heard of the guy. And, uh, I, you know, there are a few things I can't remember from my time in chapels, but he spoke and his text was Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, speaking the truth and love. And uh, he just talked about the beauty of interpersonal relationships and friendships as context where counseling per se can happen. And again, to you and I, that probably sounds somewhat like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we got that at our age and our experience. But, you know, for a 18 year old, you know, undergraduate student who had grown up in a fairly, you know, seeker sensitive church culture, I was, you know, lights just kind of began to click off. I had never heard someone articulate things the way that David had. And I think that kind of just then set me off on a journey uh, into biblical counseling. And obviously I did not end up as a history teacher. I ended up as a counselor. So God, God obviously had other plans for which I'm grateful. Was there a time for you where, or, or was there a time for you when you realized I need to give my life to this work of counseling, wherever that would be, and leading a counseling ministry as you do now, um, count, counseling people in a local church? Was there a moment where that dawned on you? Yeah, that's a good question, Rush. I. When, when we moved to Ohio from uh, where I was doing uh, undergrad and graduate work with my wife, uh, when we moved to Ohio, we came to a church uh, that we thought was going to be just a little bit of a part-time job for me to kind of do counseling on the side. But, you know, the greater part of my job was going to be teaching at a local school. And probably about six weeks into it, um, our senior pastor had a pretty significant moral failure. Uh, and I remember when all of the, when all of the stuff kind of came out, um, his wife was really in the dark, didn't know any of it was going on. And the elders uh, said, Hey, uh, can you call up, can you call up so-and-so and sit down with her and talk to her and share all this with her? And again, you know, I'm, I'm like fresh out of school. I'm like, what? Like, you want me to do what? And uh, I remember that conversation. Like it was yesterday, Rush. We had a, our women's ministry coordinator came along with me for the meeting. And I remember very, you know, in a in a really poor way, probably just kind of fumbling my way through trying to, you know, share what was going on with her husband, with the church. She was obviously devastated, just a massive pile of tissues. I remember was just next to her. And I think I remember coming out of that me meeting thinking, 
I am way in over my head. I'm way in over my head. And Lord, Lord, help me. And and I think that like when I think about counseling ministry, you know, that's probably one of the very first quote unquote appointments I did. I think I realized how much I did not know and how much help I really needed. You know, you come out of you come out of college and seminary thinking, like, I got this, like I know, you know, I, I know all the answers. And in that moment, I was so reminded of, man, you don't know anything. You don't know anything. And if not for the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the leading uh of the Lord in that woman's life, like you, like, what are you doing? Like, what do you have to offer in that moment? So it was very humbling. It was very humbling, but it was also very, uh, it was very arresting for me in the sense of, man, I, I need to do a lot of work if this is something uh, that I want to continue to, to grow in and to make a life in. Rescue Plan and Rescue Skills are two books written by Jonathan Holmes and Deepak Reju, which together can help you chart a course to restore prisoners of pornography. Pornography addiction is a pervasive problem, even in Christian circles. If you want to help someone who has become a prisoner of this sin, you'll need to know your enemy and the terrain on which you'll be fighting. Rescue Plan draws on the research and experience of these two biblical counselors, giving concrete information and helping you to shape an effective plan of attack for strugglers young and old, whether single, dating, or married. And although it can stand alone, for maximum effectiveness, Rescue Plan pairs with Rescue Skills, also by Deepak Reju and Jonathan Holmes. You can find Rescue Plan and Rescue Skills everywhere books are sold. Uh, you know, on, on our podcast here, this these are organic conversations, so I might put you on the spot here. Um, <laughs> That's fine. What would you say are maybe the most obvious to you, the most obvious, I don't know, maybe two or three lessons or realizations that came to you in the course of mm-hmm. having to minister to people? And they were just things that you just can't learn by taking a class. I you need to really walk with someone and meet them in their experience and their trouble. And that is the way that you get the case wisdom. What, what were two or three, did they come to mind for you? Big lessons? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say one lesson I, I took away was that, you know, in undergraduate and seminary training, I mean, you learn a lot of information. I mean, how, to, to help people to ask questions, you know, putting them through an interpretive grid, certain passages of scripture, how to interpret those passages. I mean, uh, you know, you're spending upwards of six to seven to eight years, even perhaps getting ready for counseling. And I think that one of the lessons that I learned very early on was just how there is a simplicity to counseling as well, that training and seminary can't give you meaning, just, just the ability to do what we're doing, just to have a conversation. And that not to feel stilted of like, okay, what do I do next? Okay, so I go to this passage and then I'm going to ask these two questions. And then this takes me here. Like it's some, you know, large flow chart where, you know, where you're, you know, going through a decision tree. Um, I think that's what I thought counseling was going to be. It was just going to be very kind of cookie cutter. We've got eight sessions. We got the eight eyes. We've got the love, no speak, do, and just this lovely package that we put together. And I think that the simplicity of counseling of just, resting and listening and being with people was something I wasn't prepared for. I remember when I came to Parkside, after our church went through its transition and Parkside uh, replanted us, uh, we had Ed Welch come out and do a conference for us, which was kind of my first introduction to uh, CCEF at that time. Um, I had signed up for counseling observation with Ed at when in the School of Biblical Counseling. I remember watching uh, him counsel, and two things came to mind. One was okay, that's, it's very normal what he's doing. It's very simple. I mean, he's just talking to these people. And the second thing was, man, how do I, how do I learn that? How do I grow in that? Because there was such a simplicity to what he was doing, but there was obviously a skill that was underneath that, that like you said, you learn through case wisdom, I think. So a lot of counseling, as you and I both know, is, is so much experience. It's just, it's doing it. It's failing at it. It's um, learning lessons the hard way, but a lot of times when you counselors are like enamored with new modalities or theories or techniques um, that used to, I think in my youth enamor me as well. But now 
I think what I value is just the simple ability to just sit and listen to people and just have a conversation with them, um, which I think generationally and culturally is a skill that is um, not as well honed. And a lot of people just don't don't use them, don't use those skills very often. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's really true. And that's been true to my experience. And actually, it's interesting the, what you're saying is interesting because it comes back to the idea, I think, of poetry, sort of, mm-hmm. uh, this so, This probably sounds cheesy, uh, sort of poetry in motion. There's an aspect of yes, counseling yes. that is sort yes. of, um, it's sort of artistic. It's not simply propositional, just like you said, yes. do this, then do this, then give this, then everything is better. There is a, a frightening it's frightening for me a lot of times because I, I don't I don't really like to be in a situation where I'm not sure what's coming next. And right. there is that kind of fluidity that's needed to walk with someone and be able to be present. And I think that scares I think that scares us a lot uh, and probably holds right. us back from ministering to people because we're, we're afraid, you know, how many times I've heard someone say, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing. And that's certainly true. We, it's possible to say the Mm -hmm. wrong thing. I've said the wrong thing many times to people. Yes. Um, but there is that kind of poetry or art, Uh, you know, Mike Emlett's book crosstalk Mm -hmm. helped me Mm -hmm. to think about that more carefully, uh, about how I could use the Bible and how I could, in a more natural way, be able to, yeah. you know, yeah. identify with people and yeah. try to try to help them with the same help that I need, you know. Yeah, I I think that line of like counseling being poetry in motion is is a really apt way to describe it. And you know, it's it's poetry in motion. It's like good jazz music. It's like you know, you and your wife are, are cooking a meal and she's tasting it and adding something in. You're putting something in. You're adding an ingredient. There's a a very much in the moment walking in the spirit uh, dynamic. I think that happens in counseling that like you said, can be scary for some people, but I think it's scary because we realize how self-reliant we would like to be to follow a plan, a paradigm, you know, three great principles to reduce anxiety or four great tips to escape depression. But, you know, I think when you and I, when we read Jesus in the gospels, we realize that's rarely, if ever, how Jesus counsels or has conversations. There's just, like you said, there's this poetry in motion um, to where, you know, that is a skill I think that over time we develop, that we catch, that we hone uh, as counselors. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, you, you brought it up a second ago. You know, I, I really, this is not just podcast talk, Jonathan. You really are an interesting person to me. And <laughs> I I love talking to you for that reason. Oh, that's um, so kind. I enjoy um, hearing what you think and being able to talk through these things together. Now, you, you brought up a second ago the picture of um, making dinner with your wife. And yeah, th- yeah. that's obviously something that you love to do is cook. Right, because I've yes. seen I've seen yeah. this, and this is this is really another interesting <laughs> side uh, to you. And yeah. um, what's what's going on with all of that? How, how and, and, your, yeah. and your your kids are cooking with you and making cake pops. Yes, what's yes. going on in the kitchen? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, like I mean, like any good counselor, right? All of our all of our stuff comes out of some degree our past and our family of origin. When I was growing up, but uh, my family grew up fairly poor. Uh, we didn't have a lot to like make meals. We did a lot of takeout. Um, you know, if you could make a casserole out of it, you know, I've probably had it. And I remember like thinking to myself, like, yeah, this, you know, this is getting the job done, but I'm sure food could be much more enjoyable than this. And, um, you know, when I went to college, I worked for a catering company to kind of make some money on the side and just started playing around in the kitchen and, uh, with food and whatnot and watching food network and things like that. And, just realize I, I mean, first of all, I love to eat. So I think it's very utilitarian in that sense. I love to eat. I love a good meal. Uh, and there's just something about cooking where I love preparing something for other people, preparing things with people that just is really fun. Um, I'd also say just in all honesty too, I'm like, as a guy, there are just few things like, you know, a lot of guys are really, uh, well-versed at sports and athletics. And that was just not something that I ever was gifted at. So 
I also felt like I just needed, I needed something. I needed something that, uh, a hobby to, a hobby to engage in. And so for me, cooking just kind of filled that void. Whereas, uh, sports is, is, is that hobby for a lot of other guys. So. So what was your upbringing like in your family? What was your childhood and your, yeah. you know, those fam, those early yeah. days in your family like that made you who you are today? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, my story is a little bit complicated. It's not unique though to, you know, any of your other listeners in terms of the complexities and difficulties that come with uh, growing up, you know, and, and uh, you know, some of the maybe distinctions though, or differences I'm adopted. So, you know, there's some complexity with that. Um, grew up in the deep South. Uh, dad was a pastor, but kind of, we went from church to church. Uh, he that. never really was able. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Grew up as a pastor's kid. Uh, but because of his problems being able to hold down a job in church, um, and kind of being on the other end of it, it's why I'd always kind of sworn to myself, I would never become a pastor. Like, I, you know, being on the other side of things, I'm like, God, please, I will do anything except for be a pastor. So that's, you know, kind of the great irony of my life. Um, but I would say for the most part, my childhood was pretty rough. Um, my, my dad passed away two years ago. Uh, my mom, my adopted mom is still living, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough and it's a complicated relationship. There's a lot of brokenness there. Um, so I try to be as thoughtful as I can when, when talking about my past and upbringing. Um, but also realizing and acknowledging it, you know, it wasn't this, you know, real pleasant, you know, roses and buttercups type upbringing uh, where everybody got along. Uh, there was a lot of hardship and difficulty. So I think in some ways, uh, when you think about family of origin and counseling, I very much am somebody who, you know, in their adulthood was trying and is trying to kind of recreate uh, a childhood that I didn't have and respond to some of the brokenness and difficulties uh, of my upbringing. Um, and that's where, you know, counseling, you know, my family and uh, people who have poured into my life have been, you know, God's instruments of like grace, you know, along the way in that process. So, so where in the deep South did you grow up and what was particularly rough? Yeah. About your upbringing? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, for your listeners, I grew up in this really, really tiny town when I first came over, uh, called McCray, Georgia, a uh, really, really small town. Eventually, we moved to like a suburb of Savannah uh, called Hinesville. So right off of the coast. Um, early on in life, my parents divorced. Um, and so my mom stayed there in the Hinesville, Brunswick area. My dad moved back to his hometown of McCray. So I would kind of spend the weeks with my mom and then the weekends with my dad. Uh, they eventually got back together, divorced again multiple times. So Again, a little bit of a rough story there, but I'd say in terms of the challenges, you know, I have a I have a picture of my kindergarten class, and uh, half the class is black, half the class is white, and right in the center of the picture is this little Asian American kid, you know, in the middle of the picture, and uh, there's a Confederate flag on one side, an American flag on the other side, uh, and that was yeah, that was my upbringing. It was very you know, it was racially. Uh, it was a racially charged environment. Um, and, you know, again, I, I understand that a lot of things have changed since the 80s, but uh, that was that was very much the dynamic. You grew up realizing you obviously look different than any other person around. I never saw anybody else who looked like me in those early days. Um, but, you know, the, the those old adoption narratives of, hey, we don't see you as anybody different than us. You look just like one of us. You know, you're trying to deal with that tension of you're hearing your parents tell you that, but then physically you look around and you're like, but nobody else really looks like me. So, yeah. What were your friendships like growing up in school or in the neighborhood? Yeah, I, you know, friendships were, were pretty tough. We moved around a lot when I was a kid. So we probably, we moved around Rush probably, oh gosh, 15, 20 times in like eight to 10 years. So I think early on, I just tried to blend in, adapt because I knew like, it's not really worth trying to invest in good friendships uh, as it were. So I, I would say like most of my friendships, honestly, I don't think really formed and deepened until probably late high school and college. Uh, you know, at college, I would say a lot of my friends who, you know, still to this day, I would consider lifelong friends. You know, I think that there's something about that collegiate 
four year residential life that just really facilitates those deep, meaningful friendships. And I'm so grateful to the Lord for bringing those people into my life. And, you know, in, in some ways, I think brought a lot of healing and restoration to a, to a childhood, an early elementary childhood that, you know, felt uh, very lonely at times. So. I'm very happy to tell you about the CSB Life Council Bible, Practical Wisdom for All of Life. The CSB Life Council Bible, developed in partnership with LifeWay and New Growth Press, is designed to equip readers with biblical truth and counsel on a wide range of topics and tough life issues related to relationships, marriage, parenting, and more. The Bible is full of useful tools and resources for life application and discipleship grounded in the truth of the gospel of grace. The CSB Life Council Bible includes more than 150 full-length articles from respected Christian counselors and scholars. Article contributions come from David Pallison, Ed Welch, Amy Baker, Mike Emlett, Elise Fitzpatrick, Diane Langberg, and many more. And the Life Council Bible includes over 100 word studies focusing on key words from the Bible applicable to personal healing, growth, and counsel. The CSB Life Council Bible features the highly readable, highly reliable text of the Christian Standard Bible. The CSB captures the Bible's original meaning without sacrificing clarity, making it easier to engage with Scripture's life-transforming message and to share it with others. Visit newgrowthpress.com today to learn more about the CSB Life Council Bible, practical wisdom for all of life. So your dad had a hard time keeping those ministry yeah. jobs going. And so yeah. you, you were yeah. involved in church, though, as you moved around? And, yes, um, how yes. How did you become a Christian? Yes. We did. I mean, my dad had a difficult time holding down jobs. Uh, we were always kind of moving from small Southern Baptist church to Southern Baptist church in the Deep South. Um, I would say we were the type of family that was at church pretty much anytime the doors were open. Uh, so, I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek services, definitely grew up in that type of culture. And I think what it eventually bred, at least within me, I'm not saying this happens for everybody, was just very much like a works-based righteousness. So if like you had asked me at like a young age, like, hey, like, why do you think you're going to heaven? I would probably have given you some type of answer related to, well, I'm a good person. I go to church. I read my Bible. I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Um, I'm just a good person. And, um, I would say later on, like early high school, I just got to a spot where, again, it, there wasn't a real relationship with the Lord. It was just more to do points. And I think I got really disillusioned by that. Um, I got saved, uh, my sophomore, the summer in between my freshman and sophomore year, our church was at a summer camp and, uh, the, the speakers were talking about true repentance and I remember the whole week they're talking about, you know, repentance from sin, et cetera. And again, being a good person, I'm like, well, what do I have to, like, I don't have anything to repent from, you know, I'm a good person. And they really ham, yeah, I'm righteous. And they really hammered that home. And I think that entire week, I really did feel like the tug of the Holy Spirit in my heart of just like, you're, you're not, you're not regenerate. You're not a Christian. You're just going through the motions because you're a pastor's kid. But I had such deep shame and embarrassment about being a pastor's kid. And everybody thinking that I'm a Christian, that I'm like, well, I can't go forward, you know, at the high school camp and like, quote unquote, get saved. So, you know, I held out, you know, tried to quench the working of the Holy Spirit, I think, in my life. But, you know, on Thursday night, you know, I went forward. And I think I would say, at least in my thinking, and as I look back at my history, that really was the time that I think I truly gave my life over to the Lord. And then I think over time, like moving into college, it really did begin to crystallize. And I realized just how dependent on my own works my salvation had been. So, uh, you know, you know, one particular passage of scripture that was like a, a pivot point for me was uh, the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, when I was at college, uh, went to, went to Grace Community out in California and John MacArthur at that time was teaching through Luke 15. And, you know, all of my growing up, I always thought, yeah, the, you know, the brunt of this parable is about a really bad kid who goes out and does some bad stuff and, you know, comes back and the father accepts him. 
And, you know, like the preaching of the word oftentimes does, my eyes were just open to realize that the focus of that parable really is on the older brother and his refusal to enter into the joy of the father over the recovery of lost sinners and just his self-righteousness, his dependence on his own work to be right with the father. And I just realized, man, I, that's me. I think that was me growing up. I was the older brother and uh, it was, it was very convicting. So yeah. So in, in some ways I would say my Christian faith really began there like that summer of high school, but really grew and developed from that point, you know, up until now. So. Well, you've given me a lot to think and pray about. All five of my kids are pastor's kids. And yeah. so, you know, I think that's a common, that's a, that's a common struggle. For, yeah, that's a common struggle is. for everybody. And the way that you've described kind of the context where you grew up, you know, places like that really make for some difficult Absolutely. ministry because yeah. it does, you know, a, a kind of uh, feeling of, righteousness in ourselves because of what we've Mm. done really has a lot of power to assure us or to put on some blinders and we just don't see as clearly or hear what we need to hear um, until the Lord breaks through. And so it's really, it's, it's a, it's wonderful to hear the way the Lord broke through to you given uh, those struggles. I mean, struggles in your family and moving around a lot and, you know, not a lot of friends, but still involved in your local church, which was faithful to take you to this camp and for you to yes. hear. It's really, yes. really a, a, yeah. a wonderful testimony. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back for a second to your adoption. I'm just curious um, if your parents, you know, talk to you about the the process of your adoption and sort of what life was like for them that led them into that decision. You know, that's 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 always yeah, a big decision. Yeah. Uh, and what was that like for them? Yeah, my my understanding of it, Rush, is that my mom my mom struggled with infertility and they weren't able to have kids. And so, you know, like a lot of other couples out there who you know dearly and deeply desire children, adoption. Adoption really was a a grace in their life to be able to have a family. Um, I think, too, I try to give my parents a lot of grace and credit in the sense of, you know, how adoption uh, was talked about and how it was viewed and how it was handled in the, you know, early 1980s looks a lot different than it does now. So a lot of the things that we know about children who come out of, you know, traumatic settings or come out of orphanages or uh, really traumatic foster care situations, a lot of that information just was not available to them. Uh, so when my parents adopted me, I mean, they never they never went to Korea. They never did a home study. They didn't do any type of cultural, you know, learning or education. I I flew over with a flight. I flew over with a flight attendant from Delta Airlines. My parents went to Atlanta International Airport, picked me up and drove me home. So, you know, it was, uh, it just looked so much different. Like nowadays when I hear People talk about adoption. It's like the studies and the culture visits and the language learning. And and again, I, I don't fault my parents for that at all. They, I think, did the best that they could with what they had. Um, but, you know, looking back on it now, a lot of adoptees who kind of came out of Korea in particular in the 80s, which was kind of the height of like the big push uh, for adoption here in the States. Um, it is fascinating, though, how many commonalities a lot of those adoptees share and just in terms of like reconnecting with their, um, you know, cultural and ethnic backgrounds and some of the you know, difficulties and challenges of growing up in, um, you know, conservative evangelical spaces where, you know, you really didn't see anybody who looked like you for the majority of your life. So um, I think that, you know, I've talked about adoption in different settings before, and I try to just share with people, you know, my story is does not have to be every adoptee story. I know that there are a lot of adoptees out there who are in loving families and have really positive experiences. And I would say, yeah, there was a lot of positives with mine. There were some difficulties with mine. Um, so, you know, like in counseling, like we tell people, you know, everybody's story is unique and um, just getting to know each of those stories can be helpful in just expanding out our case wisdom and understanding of people in general. So. And there's a God who works all things for good. And that's a yes, you know, 100% theme in yeah. your, in your story. How has yeah. your cultural and ethnic background, I need to say that more clearly, how has your cultural and ethnic background influenced you to this day, or even even your family, um, whether it's yeah. uh, traditions or you know things that you're yeah. observing and, and valuing as a family? 
Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think that, you know, and again, I've talked about this on in, in other places, but probably about two years ago, I was able to reconnect with my birth family through um, a DNA test. And I would say that's been a huge component for me of really reconnecting uh, with a lot of my like cultural and ethnic background, customs, language, et cetera. Uh, so for my kids, you know, who are half Korean, half white, uh, you know, I wanted to, I think in some ways, uh, recreate and offer a lot of what I felt like was at least missing in terms of that cultural connection. So, you know, whether it's through food or customs or language, you know, we have tried not not perfectly by any means, but we've tried to do as much as we can to connect them to that side uh, of their heritage. And I think in connecting with my birth family now, that's then obviously uh, in a helpful way accelerated that to some degree for my kids. So um, it's yeah, it's been a, a wonderful, a wonderful grace from the Lord for sure. That's really that's really great. That's awesome. Do you, how have you seen your kids value that influence? Uh, those uh, those lessons learning about uh, yeah. their own uh, heritage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, they're over the moon about it. I mean, my my kids, um, I think, have always had questions about you know my own story of adoption and um, you know what does it mean to be Asian American here in the states. And so, I think for them, it's been like a crash course uh, educationally in culture, uh, and they've just soaked it up. I think that you know there's an understandable sense of excitement and pride in uh, their Korean heritage and ethnicity um, that, you know, belonging to a larger family now here in the States has kind of uh, brought them into. So it's a wonderful point of discussion uh, for us. Um, and, you know, it's been, I, I think the other neat thing for us is that together with my kids, we've been able to kind of learn and do this journey together because it seems to be happening like in real time. So that's been another neat aspect of it as well. That is, that is neat. Tell me a little bit about Fieldstone Counseling and what ministry is like for you there. How, how do things work in your counseling center? And Yeah, yeah. So Fieldstone is an independent counseling center that kind of grew out of the counseling ministry uh, that we have launched at Parkside. And so Fieldstone is about six years old. And uh, we're based here in Northeast Ohio uh, in terms of brick and mortar locations. And when we started, we thought primarily that our uh, audience would be Northeast Ohio. But just through God's providence, uh, uh, he's grown Fieldstone. We have counselors now uh, both here in Northeast Ohio and across the country uh, through telehealth and remote counseling. We see people in all 50 states, 20 different countries. Um, and really, I would say Fieldstone is a story of just I think God's blessing and just the need, the immense need that there is out there right now for solid biblical gospel centered counseling. Um, when we started, we, you know, we had, I think probably four or five people that were going to offer counseling through Fieldstone and we had no clue if we'd have five counselees or 50 or 500. And um, I would say, you know, six years into it, the need is just enormous so there are many days where I feel really overwhelmed and uh, unprepared for just the amount of need that we're facing. Um, but then, you know, I'll hear stories from our counselors and from our counselees of just how God is working in their children's lives, their churches, their elder teams, their marriages. And uh, that that definitely gives me energy for the day. So uh, we, you know, would love to be of help and service to, you know, people all across the country, across the globe. Our mission. Uh, is that we offer lasting hope for life's hardships. And I would say a derivative of that mission as we've grown is that we want anybody anywhere in the world to be able to have access to biblically-based uh, gospel-centered counseling. Um, so uh, that's that's what we've been doing over the past six years. We're, we make a lot of mistakes. We try to learn from those mistakes. We try to grow uh, and stay humble and dependent on the Lord. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely a job that I'm eager to come to uh, pretty much every morning, which I'm thankful for. Yeah, I could ask you a, a hundred questions about it just because it would help <laughs> help me. You know, it always helps me to <laughs> hear how counseling goes um, in other places uh, among other people. But um, one question I think is important and helpful is in, in your experience in your counseling center. What do you find is the the kind of ultimate uh, provocation 
that leads someone mm-hmm. to uh, reach out for counseling or come to the counseling center? What's the thing that sort of mm-hmm. nudges them over the line? Because it's a big decision, you know, to to it reach is. out for counseling. What do you think is that nu- that final nudge mm-hmm. for a lot of people? Because uh, yeah. those are thinking, yeah. uh, do I need counseling? Should I should I have some some extra help with this or that? What What do you think is yeah. Just, what do you see as that? That's a great question. I, and you know, if you ask, if you ask me that question on another day, I might give you a different answer, but I guess what comes to my mind now is just a sense of I'm at the end of my rope, just a, a lack of hope. Um, a lot of people because of the resources that are available to them now through the internet and social media and self-help books it's like, okay, let's let's try as many things as we can. Let's throw everything up on the wall. Better communication, uh, life coaching, read the self-help book, believe in myself more, more date nights. Or yeah, It's like, okay, we'll try everything. And then there is this nagging sense of, man, something is still not right. Why is this so hard? And it's that sense of just coming to the end of your rope, coming to your sense of just realizing like, man, I think I need somebody else. I think I need somebody to help me see something differently. Um, confront me, speak truth in my life, speak truth and love to my spouse, you know, more often than not, like not me, but my spouse. Um, so I think that a lot of people make the plunge into counseling for that. It's just a, at its core, it's just a hopelessness of, hey, we've looked at everything that the world has to offer. We've looked at all of the internal resources we possess, and we are still coming up short. To which I would say, amen. Like that is, that is then the perfect pathway then for the gospel of, yeah, you have utter need and that utter need can be met in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so for me, that's where, you know, I think what we do here at Fieldstone and what so many other gospel center counseling centers get the privilege of doing is just in the brokenness of people's lives, uh, just coming into that brokenness and offering true hope in Christ. Mm. When this episode comes out, there may be people that see Fieldstone as a good opportunity or good option for them. What would be the best way to get involved in counseling for someone who who yeah. is over that line? You know, they feel the nudge. Yeah. No, thank you for that, Rush. Uh, they could go to our website. It's www.fieldstonecounseling.org, fieldstonecounseling.org. Uh, all the information about how to pursue counseling is available on our website. Uh, one of the unique things about Fieldstone is that we don't charge a fee. Uh, we ask for a suggested donation. Uh, so what that means is that people, regardless of their financial ability to pay, uh, are able to receive gospel-centered counseling. Um, and so you can get more information about how to pursue that uh, on our website. And uh, it would be our honor to come alongside you and to be of help. So... Um... So you've studied at Masters University, Trinity uh, Seminary, yes. CCEF, and you, you're, yes. you're a part of the Biblical Counseling Coalition. I, I'm curious in all of that time, if you could, I know it's a hard question to answer, but if you could narrow down to your top three influences I mean, that's like telling yeah. your top five oh, NBA, gosh. you I know, know. <laughs> you know, you know who, or who the greatest of all time, obviously, is Michael Jordan. Um, LeBron, LeBron James. James, LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> who, who are your top three? Who are your top three influences yeah. that really made an impact on yes. you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in not just counseling, but just life in general, I would say, you know, one of them is our mutual friend that we have. His name is Joe Keller. And uh, Joe, at the time when I was at Masters, was the Dean of Student Life. And so much of my spiritual life, I think, really began at Masters in terms of just discipleship and friendship and people pouring into me. And Joe was a huge part in that. Um, you know, in, in many ways, I've, I've told people he is like a father to me. Uh, he's not old enough to be my he's, father, he's but old, he's, he's like old, a father figure old, to though. me. He's old, he right? is. He he is old. If he's, he's an older this, man. He'll, he'll appreciate that. He is an older <laughs> man. But, you know, I just never had somebody really kind of take me under their wing and just live life with me um, and just uh, be there in the good, the bad, the hard, and the rough times. So uh, he's been a huge influence in my life. He did my wife and I's premarital counseling. We, uh, you know, we talk on the phone at least once a week. He just is a a huge presence in my life. Um, Second, you know, honestly would be Ed Welch. You know, Ed has been, I would say, very formative in my understanding of uh, of counseling and uh, counseling as friendship, counseling as conversation, counseling is just the ordinary 
uh, means of grace that we live out in the church, where we're talking to people, sharing meals with people, praying with people, doing hospital visits, just the, again, to borrow his term, just the side-by-side nature of life in the church. Uh, the way that Ed thinks, I know, can sometimes be odd for some people, you know, you know, trying to follow his thinking. But uh, for me, it's like a rainbow. There's always treasure at the end. If you can track with him and understand where he's going, uh, the way that he sees scripture come to life um, is just, it's remarkable. And it's been so helpful for me in my own journey. Um, it's a third person, this, you know, the yeah, this this third person. It's not obviously a throwaway, or you know, like I'm just saying this, but but genuinely, my wife, uh, you know, in terms of like growing up with you know not good relationships, uh, either parental or, or, or friendships, you know, I genuinely don't think I knew how to be in a relationship where um, I would get called out on my sin and my selfishness and my impatience and my you know need for control more so than obviously in a relationship like I have with my wife. And to have somebody stick with me in the midst of my sin, my immaturity, my, you know, everything, um, and still love me and pursue me and want to be with me. I mean, you, you know, you and I both know as married mm-hmm. men, that's a, that's a remarkable thing. Oh, you know, sure, it's a, for sure. it's a, cri- it's, it's a, cri- it's a Christ-like thing, you know, it you just is. can't do it on your own. So, um, so she, you know, I'm mentioning her third, but she definitely has to be at the top for sure. So she's your Michael Jordan. Yeah, <laughs> LeBron James. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe so. maybe a last question, but it's a big one. Uh, yeah. I've really been trying to think more carefully and deeply about happiness. I have been influenced yeah. a lot over recent years in thinking about the role of happiness in the Christian life uh, and mm. its counterpart with holiness, the way that holiness and happiness yeah. all in a sense are two sides of the same coin. They interact with each mm. other, that true holiness is to find our satisfaction and happiness in God. And true happiness mm. is to uh, know and receive the righteousness and holiness that God gives to us by grace and that we continue to walk in. So I've been thinking a lot about that, um, the role of happiness in life. And yeah. it's helped me to hear other people that I look up to and admire answer the question, what really in your life makes you happy? What is yeah. making you yeah. happy in this what is season making me happy? of life and ministry or Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I, w- I would say my go-to answer that is genuinely true, I would say, is my family, my kids. And, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, again, we talked a lot about my, my background, my upbringing. The idea of, you know, when I would read passages in Scripture, like in Zephaniah 3.17, where it says, the Lord delights over his children. He exalts over them with gladness. I would kind of read that and be like, Uh, Like, okay, like I know that theologically to be true, but I don't, I truly don't think I really understood that until I had kids. And and again, do my kids have problems? Absolutely. Are they sinners? Absolutely. Do they drive me nuts at times? Absolutely. But the pure delight and joy I have in my children, um, I love them so much. And then for me, that has given me an immense analog then to the delight that that God has over, over me over his children, which again, I would never have thought of God like that. God is a righteous judge. He is, you know, uh, you know, this very distant, far away person that we worship, but the idea of God exulting and covering and delighting and rejoicing over us as children, um, that, you know, was just a foreign concept for me. So then in having children, I have found so much joy and happiness, uh, in being, you know, being a father, having children, uh, being an imperfect father for sure, but helping me, I think, better understand God's love for me uh, than, than in some small measure, hopefully can get shown to my children uh, mm. through me. Mm. So, yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful answer to the question. It's super, very helpful. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's been an important question to me uh, so much mm. lately. And even in counseling too, it's something that's it started to, kind of flavor my, my counseling and uh, other relationships, certainly, you know, parenting, just like you said, because so much of my earliest days uh, in counseling is that there was a 
for me this emphasis on, um, you know, obedience and life change. And yes, there was this yes. sense that maybe happiness or being too focused on, on happiness could get in the way of that. So, you know, I heard mm. and I said a lot of things like God is not concerned about your happiness. He's concerned about yes. your holiness. And I'm yes. just seeing more as I, you know, talk to people like you and have my own experience with in my relationship to God and in, in my family, just like you said, that I'm seeing a different way of understanding the Christian life than I have understood it right. for many of those years. And the yeah. example of parenting and our desire for, for our children to be genuinely happy, not just to give them you know, give them cotton candy right. and make yeah. them happy, yes. you know, and hyper, <laughs> uh, but, yeah. you know, yeah. really yeah. genuinely happy. And it's such a reflection then of the way that just as you said, God delights in us. And I mm -hmm. think that's just super important to biblical counseling mm -hmm. and not to be lost, mm -hmm. something to be guarded because yes. we want counselees to really know the happiness that God has by grace in their lives yes. and yes. to rejoice yes. in him yes. because he is yeah. delighting in us in a way that only he can. Yes. yes. I think I second that heartily and say amen, because I think if we could bring that into our counseling more, I think it could be immensely helpful that the Lord is a God who's mighty to save, who rejoices over us, uh, who, you know, as he looks at Christ, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And that sense of delight and pleasure and happiness, um, I think could go a long way in helping people uh, in, their, in their faith journey. You've been listening to Straight to the Heart, a podcast from New Growth Press. Our next episode releases next week, and I look forward to seeing you there.